first assistant even though the United States hasn't built a nuclear weapon since 1989, next year the Energy Department will spend more than $12 billion on the nuclear weapons program. That's $4 billion more than they spent when the factories were running. And there are more people on the nuclear weapons payroll now than when we were actually making bombs. What they're supposed to be doing is cleaning up the environmental mess created during 40 years of churning out warheads. Who's running the cleanup? The same corporate giants who made the mess in the first place. The same people who ran the bomb factories. The bomb factories don't run anymore, but their byproducts, 40 years worth of radioactive garbage, are stored in old underground tanks. None of the waste has ever been disposed of. We're driving past some tank farms now on the right-hand side. You see the elevated? Steve Richardson of the Energy Department is the assistant manager here at the government Savannah River facility in South Carolina. So behind this berm is a million gallon tank with high level liquid waste in it. When the Cold War ended in 1989 and the government stopped making nuclear weapons, the Energy Department got a new mission, clean up all the waste. At that time, Leo Duffy was the first assistant secretary in charge of the cleanup program. You know, we started out with a billion dollars in 89, and when I left, it was about uh, $6.3 billion in the 94 budget. Duffy says while he was there on an average cleanup project, 35% of the money went right down a rat hole. One specific example that I thought was really a perfect example was the Rocky Flats uh, solar ponds. At the Energy Department's Rocky Flats plant in Colorado, these ponds were used to capture the radioactive runoff from plutonium processing. The idea? Evaporate the water, mix the leftover radioactive sludge with concrete, and bury what they call pondcrete blocks 600 miles away in the Nevada desert. But it didn't work, according to Vic Resendez. Resendez is in charge of energy issues for the General Accounting Office, the investigative arm of Congress. After the contract had completed 16,000 of these blocks, DOE found out that the mix of concrete and sludge had not been in the proper proportions, and over half started to crumble. What originally was expected to be a $27 million cleanup is now estimated to cost anywhere from $180 to $200 million. $200 million to clean up the mess they made trying to clean up the mess they made. Now, the Energy Department is trying a far more complicated and far more costly solution for cleaning up the millions of gallons of nuclear waste in the underground tanks at Savannah River. It's built a massive new factory to melt the nuclear garbage into glass logs for storage. Each log will be a witch's brew of hazardous and toxic chemicals spiced with radioactive waste. Today, at least five years behind schedule, and billions of dollars over budget, the project is still just in the testing phase. But the Energy Department must do something, even though the General Accounting Office says the whole process, called vitrification, may never even work. The Department of Energy is still pouring money into the Glass Logs project. What was the uh, initial estimate? I believe the initial estimate of the facility was just less than a billion dollars. And uh, so far, how much have you spent? I, I'm not sure exactly of the, of the today's date spending. I think we're forecasting it will come in about twice what our initial estimate was. But the General Accounting Office says it will be double that. We estimate that the cost of vitrified those ways down the Savannah River will run over $4 billion. Even if they ever manage to make the glass logs out of radioactive waste, what do you do with the glass logs? No state has agreed to store them. No one wants a nuclear dump in his backyard. No matter, the Energy Department is building yet another glass log plant in Hanford, Washington, and the projected costs keep rising. That project's been put on hold because of technical problems. But we've seen the cost escalate there from $4 billion originally to over $50 billion. $50 billion. That's correct. How much extra money, in your view, is being spent that we could be saving? There's no way of knowing. DOE doesn't have the information systems to know whether, in fact, 
the contract that could have avoided some costs and basically relies on the contractor for self-reporting. You're kidding. You're kidding? No. Ever since the Manhattan Project of World War II, the U.S. government has paid industrial giants like DuPont and Westinghouse hundreds of billions of dollars to run the factories that made atomic bombs. At first, none of the companies wanted to do the dangerous work, and so the government was forced to agree to sweetheart deals. No matter how many cost overruns there were, and even if everything went wrong, the government was obliged to pay up anyway, and still is. In essence, DOE pays the contractor for all costs incurred in managing the facility. Beyond the contract? <clears throat> all costs incurred. So they have a contract for X amount of money, but if they go over that, no matter for what reason, no matter for poor performance or frivolous reasons, the government just pays it anyway? In essence, DOE is liable for paying no costs. And he means all costs. Even $7,000 worth of golf balls and greens fees at employee golf tournaments. And $19,000 for umpires and scorekeepers at employee softball games. That's what the government paid at its Oak Ridge, Tennessee facility, where defense giant Martin Marietta has the contract. And that's chunk change compared to the billions the Energy Department has spent at Savannah River where two different contractors have tried and failed to make the glass log project work. When uh, the contractors do change for whatever reason, does a whole new workforce come in to replace the uh, previous workforce? We haven't seen that. For example, at Savannah River, DuPont managed that facility for probably 30 or 40 years. When they left and Westinghouse took over, of the 15,000 people that worked at that facility, probably less than a hundred management jobs actually changed hands. So the DuPont workers became workers for the new contractor? That's correct. In addition, we paid, paid them severance, severance pay of over $60 million. Paid who six, severance pay? The DuPont workers that are now Westinghouse workers. Why? It was part of the contract. You're saying that even though those workers did not lose their job, the federal government still paid them severance. That's correct. And they're still working there, of $60 million. That's correct. We had a hard time finding out what all those thousands of people were doing down there. After all, the factories and reactors are shut down. The glass log plant is still in the testing phase. And so far, cleaning up the environment around the plant is just a demonstration project. But somehow, there's still plenty of overtime. How much did you pay in overtime here last year? I don't know that number. I, I believe Westinghouse was running uh, to between 10 and 15 percent as a company in overtime, which is a relatively high number. At its 35 sites last year, the Energy Department spent an estimated $200 million just on overtime. And remember, they weren't making anything at any of the facilities. At the Rocky Flats plant, the contractor, EG&G, is supposed to be reducing the workforce. But instead, it keeps adding more and more white-collar workers who spend their time writing work rules. Try this work rule. How many nuclear workers does it take to change a light bulb at Rocky Flats? This is the work package spelling out the rules for that job, changing a light bulb in a radiation area at the plant. It's 317 pages long. Now, you're going to think we're putting you on, but it took 43 people to change one light bulb. It actually took only two electricians less than an hour to do the work, but it took 41 people more than a thousand hours to put this little plan together. We asked the Energy Department, Steve Richardson, if he thinks the Savannah River facility is keeping 22,000 people fully employed. No. Well, that's what you have. Well, I understand that. And we're, we're continually looking for for people that are not fully employed, obviously not every single individual is, and, and both Westinghouse and DOE are, are trying to find those examples and, and root them out. That may be, but as we said, there are more people working in the U.S. nuclear weapons program today than there were in 1989 when we were still actually producing warheads. The contractors employ 140,000 workers, and they're supervised by 5,000 federal employees. 
what on earth are all those people at DOE doing? They're supposed to be managing the contractors. They're supposed to be managing the contractors, but they're not. They're not doing a very good job. Instead of reining in the contractors, they reward them with bonuses. Consider the case of the contractor at Savannah River. How would you rate Westinghouse's performance overall? They're probably average to above average. It kind of makes you wonder what constitutes below average performance. The glass log plant still isn't finished five years after it was scheduled to be running. And now Westinghouse is working on a new facility to recycle tritium from aging nuclear warheads. And as usual, they're behind schedule and way over budget. Was Westinghouse ever penalized in any way for, for messing up on this? They were hit very heavily for cost and financial management problems at a number of key facilities, and the replacement tritium facility was, was one of the biggest ones. Were they denied their bonus? Uh, their bonus was substantially reduced as a result of that. Clearly, we dinged them there, but there's a lot of other things well, going on on the site that are doing better. You say you dinged them there, and I have in my hand the uh, report that you put out publicly on the bonus that they got for this last uh, six months. Mm -hmm. And you say in here that they did nothing but make mistakes, and you gave them a bonus of $7.4 million. There's some things they have done well, that we gave them that we gave them credit for going on this. Yeah, but why give them a bonus at all? If they mess up, why do they get anything? And seven million dollars is a hefty bonus in anybody's book. Seven million dollars in terms of bonus is is not a lot of money when you're talking about a two billion dollar a year operation. By our calculation, since Westinghouse came here in eighty nine, they've gotten bonuses that amount to more than fifty million dollars. And, and only once in that whole period did they ever have an assessment, a performance assessment, that said they were anything better than good. It, it, is this award bonus system working in the incentive way it's intended to? I, I, I think it is. By the way, do you get a bonus? I, I am in the senior executive service, and, and all of us are, are up and eligible for a bonus uh, every year as part of that system. but. Uh, it's, Did you uh, get one last year? No, I didn't. Why not? I don't know. Because maybe the way Westinghouse was running this place. I, I don't know. Even with a lackluster performance record, Westinghouse has survived seven secretaries of energy. Former assistant secretary Leo Duffy calls them the Weebies. Yeah. Who are the Weebies? Well, the Weebies are... We'd be here after you. <laughs> you know, we'd be here before you, and we'd be here after you. Those are the people that say, well, he's going to be gone, you know, and as soon as he goes, we'll go back to business as usual. One postscript to business as usual at Savannah River, the Energy Department's Inspector General recently reviewed 29 months' worth of expenses charged to the government, and it turns out the top executives of Westinghouse awarded themselves yet another $4.7 million in bonuses without government approval. Well, what about the Energy Department's officials who are supposed to keep track of such things? It took them more than two years to even notice that the unauthorized bonuses had been paid. 